we once again welcome you all to the panel discussion at ISMER. So each panel member will present their views in their respective topics, taking 10 minutes each. And the concluding sessions spanning 10 minutes will be for discussing, discussing the final conclusive ideas from each panel member. So let's start off the session with Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey. Sir will be briefing on the topic constructive media research for societal development. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so wonderful to see students here and uh, I can feel myself uh, in, in Kochi right there. And uh, the reminder that COVID is still on is that all these uh, wonderful students are wearing uh, their masks there. So. Uh, I'm sure uh, very soon we will uh, have a situation where we won't have to uh, face each other, you know, wearing masks like these. So uh, since this is just a 10 minute presentation, I'll be talking about a concept known as uh, actor network theory. Uh, have you heard about actor network theory, anyone? Uh, or, or can, can students respond here or uh, can I hear from students or I cannot? Or the theory? Yes. No, sir, none of us have heard about the theory. Okay. Uh, can I share the screen? I don't think that I'm allowed to share the screen, but uh, if I very quickly can. Uh, only meeting organizers and presenters can share. Uh, hey, yeah, you, I, press, you can press in, sir. Uh, now I can write. So, very quickly, I mean, uh, because, uh, you know, we were just talking about. Uh, the virus here, we know what, what, what uh, non human agents can do in, in uh, our, our society or in our regular interactions. The screen has frozen. Am I audible? Is, uh, is everything visible or, or is it Are audible and we can see what is actor network theory. Yeah, the second slide too. Yes, yes. It is okay. moving. Very good, very good. So very quickly because when we have this idea of, of society or social reality, then, you know, we try to give all the... Uh, 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 credit or we, we keep the human beings in focus. But the idea is that inanimate entities like uh, a virus, for example, or a protein, for example, or, or a mobile phone or a computer or these inanimate objects, they are as important actors in a network as human beings. So that is a kind of a very radical kind of a theory uh, by uh, Bruno Latour. Has anyone heard about Bruno Latour? Is it a name that was familiar? No. Okay. So uh, that's a, a, a kind of a radical theorist because he challenges the concept of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the social. He says that there is nothing called social reality or, or when, when we assume that, you know, when we are studying society or, or when, we, when we are talking about uh, these kind of collectives, we assume that when we are together, we uh, interact differently and so on and so forth. And that is how most of the social theories are constructed. So he challenges this particular concept of the social. And uh, as I said, one of the important things he does is by talking about or by putting these inanimate objects in a network, in a network which is very similar to humans in the network. So when we are talking of networks in this particular theory, the computer or the mobile phone or technology or even, as I said, uh, uh, you know, it could be a virus. All of them have very important roles to play. They have a very important uh, uh, position in, in uh, this kind of a, uh, a theory. So the notion of so uh, society made up of humans is replaced by a collective made up of humans and non-humans. So earlier, you know, non-humans were just more, more of a piece of a furniture, you know, people, uh, things in the background or things we can see from afar. But now we see it's, it's uh, uh, very, very different. So uh, that's how, you know, we, we consider when we're talking about, uh, for example, why do we use mobile phones or, or why do people adopt the use of uh, certain technologies? And that is where, you know, this, this kind of a theory becomes very important or this realization becomes very important that uh, the technology is not an external force. They have the potential to shape social interactions. 
and i'm sure that all of us have noticed that i mean when you sit, sit down on a train these days nobody talks to each other probably the only uh, discussion that we are having with each other is that you know when we want to use the uh, mobile phone charger on the or, or on the train compartment so we uh, see every day that how the introduction of a new actor in the network and the new actor here is the mobile phone with uh, a high speed internet connection and i'm sure all of us realize that india is one place where mobile data is cheapest it's just about 0.01 dollars per gb in the us for example it's 8 dollars per gb and in malawi as a country in south africa in, in africa it's about 20 dollars per gb so so here uh, the interactions over mobile will be much more or, or it will be much uh, intense than in other countries so these uh, technologies they have a very important role as i said to play in, in these uh, uh, networks and that's where we we, we want to uh, uh, you know uh, talk about and that's that's where you know the the uh, uh, future research can can throw us uh, can throw about some wonderful light uh, and it's not just about the theory itself but how do we ask these questions uh, as i go along am i am i audible and all uh, yes yes sir you are okay okay so the problem is is with microsoft teams and and we are not very used to that and and i keep on you know trying to find out uh, whether whether it's working or not so any uh, so 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 these uh, uh, you know is is uh, this is a method because we are trying to trace the association between the entities and the entities would be human being and uh, uh, mobile phone for example as, as i was trying to tell you so this is uh, done through three different ways why do we adopt a technology it, it says uh, the, the theory says that it, it is done in three different ways first is translation translation means i i adopt people into the technology or i bring in people into technology because it uh, provides a cert, certain uh, benefits for example if i am on mobile phones i can interact with uh, all all my colleagues on on whatsapp and uh, i can get uh, access to whatsapp messages and so on and so forth so this is this is the translation process in which we adopt technology but how we end up using it or or uh, how how we uh, uh, you know how our interactions change because of this technology is something that needs to be studied and for that since i was talking about these methods it's no longer the old survey method or it's no longer old methods of of uh, you know even even uh, uh, asking people questions through questionnaires and so on and so forth but it's it's a lot more ethnographic it's a lot more you know uh, uh, individual where we go to these people we talk to them about uh, 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 you know how how and uh, why they're using technology and when they're using it and and to what forms and so on and so forth and that is how we regard or, or that is how we place the role of technology in these uh, 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 community networks and then to the last point here i i will skip all these things because uh, uh this thing has already been recorded as a video and it's available but uh, uh this is one idea that i wanted to emphasize that when we talk of social we are talking of some stabilized state of affairs so when we are talking of law or, or, or technology or management or whatever we suggest the same kind of social forces that uh, that rule these or, or that that overgird these uh, important state of affairs but ant ant does not means ant it means actor network theory it challenges the notion of these overarching uh, social forces it suggests that there is nothing like social because we have to find out the way through which these particular networks are formed for example when we are talking of a society of academicians so how did we all get together so this this uh, distinct label of social or society is probably not correct according to this particular theory it's like uh, how do we get together how these assemblages are formed and how do they become stable because we know that these are all dynamic because the way we interact with each other does not remain static over a period of time so instead of talking about society and social fact and social reality and social forces and these kind of things we should talk about what are the causes that they, they, you know these people along with these technologies came together and what is it that that is you know uh, uh, helping them put together 
So instead of looking at society from the outside, we are looking at how did these people get together, and what is it that uh, is is. Uh, Okay, sir has informed us that he will be joining shortly. There is some technical glitch. We move on to the next panel speaker, Dr. Shakila T. Shamsu. Over to you, ma'am. Can I start, Lakshmi? Yes, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, or rather, good morning to everyone gathered at Amrita. Uh, thank you uh, to Amrita for having invited me to give you a perspective on the national education policy and how it would promote research as well as technology incorporation uh, into a discipline of media studies. Uh, and I also take this opportunity to congratulate the students who are enthusiastically gathered uh, to listen to an online symposium that is happening. Uh, I, of course, I think because uh, Dinesh Babu, uh, this uh, the previous speaker, Mr. Pa Dr. Pandey's screen is frozen, so I think that would continue to remain unless, of course, the organizers are able to take that off the screen because that seems to be slightly distracting. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Lakshmi, is that possible? Sure, sure ma'am. We are trying. Yeah. So today we are gathered on April 23rd, and I was just trying to have a look at. Uh, through the Google, which is what we all rely upon to understand whether this day has any special day as such. Interestingly, it happens to be the World Book Day and Copyright Day and seems to be very, very relevant to the context of media studies that we are gathered here today. Uh, to talk about the national education policy, I'm not too sure how many of you have actually taken the trouble to go through the national education policy. But as students who are likely to have different future trajectories, I would urge upon you to have a look at the document. And if at all, Dr. Dinesh Babu is able to circulate that to the students or make it available to them in the library, it would be good enough. Let me just try to tell you the, uh, the larger picture of the national education policy and coming specifically to how media studies in its linkages to the changes that are being proposed in the national education policy would be of immense benefit to the students of journalism and media studies, as well as to the institution itself in trying to make themselves multidisciplinary. So you are uh, uh, possibly aware as students and uh, those exposed in media, that education is one of those sectors which is one of the most sensitive in terms that it touches the lives of every single individual in whatever role that they are. And we also see that as a catalyst for bringing about tremendous transformations within the society, both at an individual level, at a societal level, and at an economic level. Now, globally, we are living in the 21st century which is an age which has moved on from an information-based society. And you all are there in the media studies as someone who is always on the intersections of providing information. And I happen to see the previous presentation on artificial intelligence and how information becomes very critical in terms of avoiding misinformation and disinformation. But the current... So 21st century is not just a world of the information society. It was one at the turn of the century, but we have now moved on to become a knowledge-based society. And what is the distinguishing factor of an information society vis-a-vis -a, -vis a knowledge-based society arises from the fact that information is merely a disseminative activity, whereas knowledge is more of an assimilative activity. And to say it is assimilative has two or three implications. One, that knowledge dimensions are across various disciplines and domains. So to just give a very relevant example of the COVID, when it started as a pandemic in early January 2020, because Kerala had the first case of the students who came back from Wuhan, we looked at that aspect of COVID 
as merely a health related crisis almost up to may 2020 by the time you had the national lockdown and you had seen migrant labor treading across roads to reach their home places and you had seen all all these unfolding dimensions of that pandemic you realized that the pandemic is not just a health crisis it has become a social crisis it has become an economic crisis it has also become a kind of a misinformation crisis because you had a lot of things that was there in the media which told us how to protect ourselves some which were correct some which were absolutely false and in that sense what i'm trying to say is knowledge makes it interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or cross disciplinary so the national education policy has come out in a context of a knowledge based society where we are not only connected through the information and communication technologies but the very nature of knowledge the intrinsic nature of knowledge calls for multi dimensional approaches in the way we learn things so to learn something only in depth without a range and without understanding the implications of other disciplines on to your own discipline will make you i would say in a certain sense caught quite short sighted or caught myopic because you are not understanding the larger dimension so the linkages between health and livelihood the linkages between health and mobility the linkages between health and social crisis and mental health crisis the linkages between media and health dimensions all these are interrelated and intrinsically interwoven making the cross disciplinary impacts very very critical that is the scenario in which we are living and therefore the national education policy is aiming to sort of bring about a very large concept or a very comprehensive concept of holistic development of individuals and all of you as young students must understand that unlike many of us when our uh, profiles were being read where we were there in decades into a given profession that comfort zone is completely shaken for you all and you need to have multiple skills and we are as human beings created by the almighty with multiple intelligences so we need not really think that we need to only specialize into one dimension we need to understand that you know a knowledge or an understanding of economics of journalism of sociology of physics of language of performing arts all these go to make up an individual and it is the cognitive the affective the experiential all of it that becomes very very critical to what we call out sort of you know uh, expressing one's own potential the four dimensions of learning in when you saw knowledge being multi dimensional learning itself is also multi dimensional in terms of learning to know learning to do learning to live together and to live with others and learning to be which is the self actualization of one's potential so the nep 2020 in terms of both these dimensions of knowledge and learning both being quite multidimensional has projected a, a set of recommendations which calls for moving away from structured systems of education which has sort of impeded our holistic development because individuals are not seen as clones of one another and they are not robots but have thinking are thinking human beings and therefore each one has unique talents unique abilities capabilities aspirations and all these potentials should be nurtured by an education system now that is the reason why the undergraduate program that we are proposing in the nep 2020 is a multidisciplinary holistic education where you can take up a combination of courses across a range of disciplines from pure sciences to social sciences to languages to vocational subjects to agriculture pharmacy economic uh, 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 nursing medicine the the range or the basket or the bouquet of courses 
which are currently so limited and where students only do vertical specializations in depth the idea of shaping students today is not in depth which is i shaped individuals but t shaped individuals where there is both depth and breadth that is range that needs to be coming in for what we call the 21st century learning where we are looking at the industry 5.0 that is now emerging which is looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics and virtual reality and big data and so on which challenges human intelligences and which make the jobs of tomorrow almost looking quite blurred because we do not know what are the skills that we have acquired and what are the kind of jobs that are going to be there so how do we make our students future ready to meet this kind of the challenge of unknown jobs or jobs where we may be asked to reinvent the knowledge and the skills that we have acquired during our educational journey now coming to the fact that multidisciplinarity itself offers a range of opportunities and i see media studies as one discipline which will allow for actually developing courses with linkages to all disciplines because as media studies deals with information how you handle information whether it happens to be economics whether it happens to be data of population whether it happens to be social data that you're looking at whether it is vocational education in all these aspects the importance of information and how you project that information is do is done through media studies and while today media studies did not have an opportunity to uh, let us say engage with other disciplines because it was confined to media studies only or per se you actually limited yourself without understanding the linkages so a journalist career for example could be in something that looks at the legal aspects or a journalistic career can look at the medical aspects or a journalistic career can look at economic issues so to know that to look at these issues you should understand what that discipline talks about and it's not just merely reporting and it's not just merely reporting uh, i just happened to see the movie naradan and just trying to show a one upmanship of being a good journalist and what is good journalism today or what is how do you how does media study need to come out in a more socially responsible manner in a democratic society by upholding certain intrinsic values that we stand for within a society becomes very very critical and i think that the nep 2020 by providing a flexible ecosystem by allowing students to take on subjects beyond the ambit of a specific discipline allows for a greater scope in the widening of media studies and its presence being felt among all disciplines and developing new courses and new curricula in th for this interdisciplinary disciplinarity now coming to the technology part of it the nep 2020 had made out a very strong case for using technology for making enriching the learning experiences making quality education available across all sections in a larger number but what is most important is that the covid forced us to go into online education and we are sitting in a virtual symposium of this kind how do you use technology you don't need a gun to shoot a rat so in the same way let us not have a one size fits all technology solution and when you do when you learn media studies whether it is print media whether it is television whether it is radio, whether it's a community radio whether it is digital media and what is the nature of that content that you're dealing with making appropriate technology decisions so that you actually maximize technology for the purpose that is intended for that particular news being covered becomes very very critical so i would say a nuanced approach of marrying technology to the various aspects of media studies 
and taking a very considered view becomes very critical from the NEP 2020 point of view. Research. Now, the NRF that we are talking about is one area, one umbrella body. And I would say that, you know, media studies would have fallen within, within, between the stools of any research funding that was currently available, whether it was the ICSSR, whether it is the DBT funding, whether it is the DST funding, all these or the CSIR funding. These media studies may not have been an area where for research you might have got a lot of funds available. But through, through the creation of the National Research Foundation, there is enough scope for getting funds for research projects related to media studies. And particularly today where the NEP 2020 has talked about multi multilingualism and allowing higher education to be offered in regional languages, I see an extensive scope for research that can come about in this area and also, you know, research which is multidisciplinary, media studies and technology, media studies and language, media studies and culture. All these are new areas of research which hitherto you may not have got chances for getting funds, but thanks to the creation of the National Research Foundation under the NEP 2020, there is sufficient scope to examine and come out with out of the box innovative thinking, look at design thinking, look at how media and social design becomes very critical in the emerging world of tomorrow. And I'm sure as students, the idea is to provoke yourselves to come out from what has been structured thinking, to develop creative thinking, to develop the spirit of inquiry, to have critical thinking abilities, and most importantly, to develop collaborative teamwork approach. So the NEP 2020 is actually talking of embedding all this within the curricula. And I'm sure Amrita, as being one of the leading institutions and ready to innovate, will be able to think in ways of leveraging these enabling mechanisms that the NEP talks about to enrich the Department of Media Studies and as students that you would be able to contribute in a more effective manner into the fields that you select within your specializations of media studies and journalism. I'll stop here and if there are there is time for questions at the end after all my esteemed panelists have spoken, I'd be only happy to interact with the students. All my good wishes in case I don't get a chance to interact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. We will move on to the session of Professor Dr. Anubhuti Yadav. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you so much. Um, OK, so first of all, um, very good morning to all the students here. Uh, in fact, uh, the changes are happening. Uh, in fact, in the last two years, you know, I have interacted with the students from Amrita uh, for like uh, four or five times. And every time Professor Dinesh used to call me, I used to tell him that, you know, the next time it should be an offline session. But anyways, uh, there is a change in the sense that earlier, like it was entirely online. But this time, at least like we can see, you know, some of the students, you know, sitting in the classroom and attending this particular symposium. And I'm sure that, you know, another few days and definitely like we'll have most of the programs uh, in an offline mode. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam for inviting me to this panel discussion. And it's always a pleasure to be in a panel which, uh, with such accomplished experts. You know, you, you listen to Professor Uma Shankar Pandey. Uh, in fact, uh, he has been working in the field of uh, media and information literacy for quite some time. Uh, and not only researching in this field, uh, he is also practicing. Uh, though, uh, you know, like you could not listen to him, you know, entirely like his presentation, you know, because of, you know, internet connection. Uh, but I would urge all of you to uh, just go to his uh, YouTube channel and have a look at, you know, some of the uh, YouTube programs, video programs, which he has made. Uh, basically, like he is trying, uh, that's an example in media literacy itself, because we have, you know, a lot of important concepts and someone has to simplify these concepts for the younger generation and also for 
for for the peers and he is you know doing that particular work um it was like pleasure listening to dr shakila i mean she was talking about future aspect of media and education research and she touched upon you know number of things and definitely we'll be listening to professor pavrala he will be talking about um radio for change community radio for change and then of course tanu dang so it's always a pleasure amongst you know these accomplished uh, people now coming on to the topic which has been given to me in fact um the brief which was given to me was uh to talk about you know media literate societies uh and scope and possibilities so if you are talking about you know media literacy you know this is something which is needed across the world and at the time of the pandemic we have seen how much it was required because there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation around covid-19 there were people who actually lost their lives because of misinformation and disinformation and we have seen uh, you know at the time of the pandemic you know international organizations like who uh, you know the national even at the national level you know our own government uh, press information bureau they started you know number of media and information literacy program so of course like it's needed everywhere but you know i'll be focusing on india you know when we talk about media and information literate societies um in india if we are talking about you know the population we are talking about you know 1.39 billion people here which means 130 crore people and right now as you all are aware we are all celebrating azadi ka amrit mahotsav we are all celebrating 75 years of independence we are celebrating we are commemorating that particular thing now um see it took us 75 years to reach you know 76 to 77 percent of literacy rate in india now if you're talking about you know 75 percent of the people who are literate we need to think about these 25 people a uh, person people who are still illiterate and i strongly feel that yes everybody has to be media literate but these 25% of people i mean who are illiterate they need you know media literacy more than anyone else because these are the people who are consuming content through videos they are the people who are consuming content through audio these are the people who are actually believing whatever is coming on you know their small screen which is like the screen of their smartphone so uh, definitely we need to work towards this but uh, it's going to be an herculean task uh, if we are saying that we have taken 75 years to reach 76 to 77 percent literacy rate so here we are talking about media and information literacy which is totally a new concept right now so uh, of course literacy is important and uh, we do have number of initiatives uh, of course national education policy is out there are a lot of things which are being done uh, you know based on national education policy by central government or by the state government to reach 100% literacy uh, but today we are living in an era wherein we need to revise we need to modify the definition of literacy there was time when we used to talk about literacy it was an ability to read and write nowadays and that was okay that was relevant when most of the content was available in the text format but nowadays people are consuming content from like uh, in the form of video they are consuming content in the form of an audio they are consuming content in the form of an images they are consuming content you know in the form of you had you know a session on automated journalism or artificial uh, artificial intelligence so uh, even like if you talk about sources you know people are consuming content from variety of sources it's not just the text it's not just you know your textbooks or books or magazines or newspapers you know in india if you talk about the numbers we have you know 900 plus satellite channels and out of that 392 plus channels are news channels we have fm radio we have community radio uh, if you talk about print you know india is the largest print market also uh there are more than 1 lakh newspapers are being published uh, from our, our our country and if we talk about digital you know we are talking about 800 million internet users when i'm saying 800 million internet users these are not just the consumer of you know media messages they are also potential 
producers of media messages. So the media content, you know, the information, the content is not only created by legacy media, it is also being created by people. Anyone who has access to smartphone can create content. They can create, not only create video, they, they can create video, they can publish that particular content on internet. So we are seeing messages which are coming in the form of tweets. We are seeing messages which are coming in the form of reels on Insta, Facebook posts, YouTube videos, podcasts. So this means that while we should be in a position to read and write the text, but we should also be in a position to read and write uh, you know, in other media formats also. So we should be in a position to not only read and write text, but we should also be in a position to access you know, media in a right way, access content in a right way. Um, Professor Shakila was talking about this thing that we have a lot of content available on internet. So what we do, whenever we have to find any content, we just type a search query and there will be millions of documents available for you. But which documents are relevant to you? What are those documents which are coming from authoritative sources? So even like accessing content has become a new skill nowadays and there are a number of ways of doing it. So it's not just typing a search query. Uh, you know, there's something called, you know, um, mastering Boolean queries. This could be something which was taught in computer science earlier. But as Professor Shakila was saying that, you know, we are talking about, you know, a multidisciplinary approach. So something which is taught in computer science. Now, even the media students have to be aware of that. And not only media students, journal public, everybody should know how to access content on, on the Internet. They should also be in a, a position to analyze content. For example, whenever there is a crisis, you type a search query, you'll find you know, a lot of results related to that. But are there results coming from authoritative sources? Are these sources credible? So you should be in a position to ask questions. Uh, you know, that concept of inquiry that Professor Shakila was talking about. Uh, then you should be able to evaluate you know, you know, media messages. And the last is, you should also be in a position to create media messages in a variety of forms. Gone are the days when you were asked to express yourself only in the form of text. Nowadays, you are doing your assignments. So many a times, even students and we people as a teachers are expected to express ourselves in a wide variety of form. As a teacher, you know, I, I have a YouTube channel also. Earlier, I, will, I had not thought of this before. We have a podcast also. So we need to create content in a variety of ways. And that's why I'm saying that this whole definition of media uh, literacy needs to be relooked. So um, if you're looking at the media literate society, that means that all should have media and information literacy competencies. And what are these competencies? The first one, they should be able to access content in a better way, analyze content, create content, reflect which means every time when we are there on digital platform we need to reflect on our own behavior how are we conducting ourselves how are we consuming information and how are we sharing that particular content with you know other people are we just sharing because you know we believe in that particular thing without verifying the content or you know we we, we whenever anything come across we spend some time with that content only uh, we share it only when we are confident that it, it's a it's a it's an accurate piece of information and the last point is when we talk about media and information literacy competency you need to act on that it's not just be you know a responsible user or creator for example if you come across something which you feel is not accurate you need to complain against that and all the media formats whether it's your, your newspaper you have press council of india when you talk about you know uh, uh, video television you have national broadcasters association when you talk about digital the new uh, you know ott and digital media guidelines have come up and there are provisions wherein you can complain against you know certain tweets or you know certain uh, digital media content you you search a lot of content on google so when you search content on google on the footer there is something called you know report this content 
we might not have seen this before, but you can report any article and any portion of any article to Google saying that, you know, there's some problem in, in this particular article, but we might not have done this before. So that's a very important part of media and information literacy competencies, uh, which is, you know, you need to act, uh, you know, if you come across any such piece of information. So, it's important to be uh, media and information literate, and we are actually looking at societies which will be media and information literate societies. But how this can be achieved? Uh, of course, like uh, the previous speaker talked about, uh, you know, national education policy. I would say that you know we are at the right time. National education policy is being implemented. Post that, of course, national curriculum framework will come. Uh, the new textbooks will be out. So here is a chance wherein we can involve media, you know, in you know different subjects also. When I'm saying different subjects, uh, and it has to start from you know a lower level. It has to start from school level, and it has to you know go till you know higher education. So when we are talking about you know different subjects at school level, for example, when we are talking about sociology. So why can't we have a, a chapter on you know, sociology of media? When we are talking about economics, why can't we talk about media economics there? When we are talking about you know, political science, why can't we talk about you know, media, the role of media in political science? When we talk about language, there is a scope there. Like when, when, we, when we talk about you know, other, other subjects, you know, there, there is a lot of scope of integrating media there in you know, our different subjects. And that is what you know, national education policy is saying, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, when we talk about knowledge, I mean, it, it is not something you know, which is linear. Right? You know, there are a number of dots. And the most important thing which we have to do is we have to connect the, those dots. We need to find out, you know, what is the relationship between, you know, the different things which are happening in the society. We talk about different subjects, right? You, you are, you know, undergrad or postgrad uh, students. We have created these subjects for our ease that, okay, it will be easy for us to deliver the subjects. Otherwise, knowledge does not exist in compartments. You go out when you look at water. I mean, you can look at water in different ways. You can look at water like from the biological point of view, from chemistry, from physics, from sociology, from political science, from anything. It's just because of our ease to deliver content better, to make things organized. You know, we have divided it into different subjects. And now the time have come that we should know how to connect these dots, how to connect the knowledge, you know, if you really want to make a uh, sense of uh, it. So uh, if you look at national education policy, uh, 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 doctor has also al already said that uh, Dr. Dinesh Babu should circulate, you know, national education policy to the students. If you look at national education policy, there is a mention of critical thinking at number of places in the document which means that there is a scope. The moment we talk about critical thinking, we are talking about media and information literacy, asking questions, asking like who has created this message, why this message has been created, why there are certain things have been included in the message and why there are certain things have been excluded from that particular message. So that's, that's one thing which we can do. Second thing, um, at, at school level, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, CBSC already has, you know, media uh, as a subject, but that's at a vocational education, which is equally important. Recently, we have worked on, uh, on a book, which, which, which is for the students from class 7th to class uh, 9th, and that's an elective subject, and that talks about media and information literacy. Even the title of the book is being media and information literate. So that's happening at the school level. NCRT is also coming up with a number of projects on digital literacy. Um, so the most important is like for, for the media institutes, uh, we have to make this as part of our curriculum. It is there in some of the universities and some of the institutes, but definitely like we require more work and the more focus should be there on media and information literacy. There should be more research in this area. And I'm happy that, you know, some of the scholars, they are, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, research at PhD level on media and information literacy. But till now, whatever researches I have seen, they're limited to the documentation of MIL initiatives in India. But there's much more to it. And that is something which we need to do. Um, UNESCO is doing uh, excellent work in this. So 
uh, Ma'am talked about collaboration. Institute should collaborate with the international organization, national organizations who are working in this particular area. For example, UNESCO, they have different groups and part of their uh, research and policy group. And we are looking at you know, the number of researches which have been conducted in the field of media and information literacy, not only by the, the experts or the teachers or the people who are in the academic profession, but also by the by the students. And in fact, this year, you know, when we'll be ce celebrating uh, Media and Information Literacy Week, so we'll be awarding best of the researches in this particular area. We do require more initiators. For, uh, for example, uh, at the time of the pandemic, when we realized that a lot of people were falling for misinformation and disinformation, there were initiatives like Fakshala, uh, wherein you know they went to tier two and tier three cities and conducted training program on uh, media literacy, telling people that how they should be consuming media messages and what questions they should be uh, asking. And the last point which I would like to make here is um, again, which is related to national education policy, and of course Professor Shakila had talked about that thing in detail. But there's this one mention in national education policy which I I really liked and that said that we need to involve youth in constructive public engagement, which means if we want to make a difference, any field, I think youth, young people like you can play a very important role. And this is what we have done. Uh, at the time of the pandemic, when students were you know, studying from their homes, at that point of time, I said that, okay, there were 77 students in my department I said, all of you will, will be conducting a workshop on media and information literacy in your area. Imagine we were able to train around 7,000 people, right, within 15 days on media and information literacy. And that was only possible because of the power of youth, right? They have interest, they are motivated, and they just went ahead and they did that particular thing. Uh, so this is what it is expected. Uh, this is how the academicians should provoke, you know, young people so that they can, they should go out in the field and they should also start training and they should also start, you know, making difference uh, in the society. Only then I think we'll be able to have a media and information literacy society. Otherwise, if we depend upon few who are, you know, occupying certain positions in different offices, then definitely it will take another, you know, 75 years, the way we had taken those many years to make people of India literate. But definitely a lot of initiatives are happening and I'm very hopeful with the people like you will be able to pull it off. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. We will move on to the next presenter, Dr. Tanu Dang. Over to you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. A very good afternoon to all of you. I think somebody at the back has said something and all the students are giggling under their masks, whatever it is. I hope it is interesting. And uh, it is indeed very uh, difficult to hold the attention of the students after they've already listened to four eminent speakers who have sp spoken before me. So I know it will be a difficult task, but uh, because I'm going to talk about public relations and it is something which is everywhere around you, I hope you will find this talk interesting. Uh, before I go ahead with the talk, I really congratulate uh, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peter. Uh, for this ISMER 2022 and the variety of topics that they have included. I'm sure this is going to be a great learning experience for all of you. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Dinesh for including me in the panel, such an August panel, such an August speakers that you've listened to before me. Uh, before starting with what I want to say, I would definitely like to uh, pick up a few points that you've listened to uh, in the previous uh, speakers' lectures, because they somehow relate to whatever I'm going to talk about. Uh, we listened to Professor Uma Shankar Pandey, who talked about society and technology. And we all know that how public relations is now being totally shaped with technology. You all are using smartphones, whatever information that you want to seek, you search on Google. And on very on that very important note, uh, we heard uh, Professor Anubhuti Yadav talking about media literacy when she actually said the very, very right line that assessing right information on the internet has become a task in itself nowadays. 
uh, it was also very enlightening to listen to Professor uh, uh, Shakila who talked about NEP because NEP is something that when you read the entire document and when you hear about it, you might find that it is a uh, boring or difficult to understand concept, but this is definitely with something which is promoting multidisciplinary learning. And one very important point that she talked about, which I'll be taking up in my PR session as well, is that you have to be multi-talented nowadays. Earlier, it was easier for you to excel in one area and probably... ...frozen because from the other end, I could see the screen frozen. I hope I'm audible and everything is working. Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay, okay great. Okay, uh, I so wish that I could have listened to Professor Vinod Parvala, but I'm sure that uh, after listening to him, there might have been nothing for me to speak about after all these eminent speakers. So the topic that I wanted to discuss today is uh, communication and its persuasive power. We all know that how powerful communication is, and you all have been using it in your day-to-day -day lives when you are actually convincing your parents for a trip that you want to go to, for a mobile phone that you really want, for a course that you want to get admitted to, you are using all that persuasive power in your real life. And that's what marketers are doing with you as well. So this is one area that we are going to talk about. You must have studied the Aristotle model in your communication. How many of you have studied it? Aristotle model of communication? Very good. So you all know that Aristotle was the first one who gave some kind of model of communication. But what I wanted to talk about is that you all know he was a great speaker. And when he talked about persuasive power of communication, he talked about ethos, pathos, and logos. How many have heard this concept? Raise your hands if you have. Okay, one of them has. Okay, two. Very good. I'm so happy that I can see you people because then it, may, it feels more like a class interaction and it's all the more interesting. So uh, why I'm going to pick up this concept is because long, long before he talked about persuasive power of communication and he mentioned ethos, pathos and logos and ethos refers, according to him, with the credibility of the source. When we talk about public relations, we all know that credibility of the source is very, very important. And with the previous lecture that you've listened to, media literacy, you know that there is so much of information available online. And it is really, really hard to actually understand which information to trust and which information you shouldn't trust. So credibility of the source has become a big issue that the PR organizations or the PR bodies have to deal with in the current situation. Now, when we talk about how PR is changing, you know, you must have seen during the COVID times and you must have felt this yourself as well. There were brands who behaved responsibly. If you people order from Zomato, if you people have been having, uh, you know, have had pizza during the lockdown period or the uh, partial lockdown period, you know how they actually kept the pizza away from you and they wanted you to pick it up from a distance. They were following all the sanitization norms. And if you had ordered anything online, you know that you always got the uh, temperature of the person who was delivering the food to you. So the brands have recognized that this is very, very important for you. And that's how they change their uh, advertise, their promotional strategies. Now, when we come to pathos, it refers to the emotional connect. We all know that when we talk about public relations or advertising, it is very important to understand how you feel and then connect with you according to those emotions. A public relation message can make you feel involved. A public relation message can make you feel agitated, sad, happy, everything at the same time. So at that point of time, it becomes very important again to readdress how important emotion is to public relations. Coming to the third part, which is logo, logos. Now we all, you know, initially, you must have read about the bullet theory as well. How many of you remember that theory? Yeah, great. So, uh, and you all must disagree with that theory now because you know more that it, communication can never be one way. It has to have reaction and responses of the audiences and also selective, per selective perception of the audiences when they are receiving the messages, right? So when we talk about logos, it means logical input that you have in the communication. We all are thinking minds, right? So uh, these thinking minds need information that they can logically relate with. So public relation is no more about all the goody goody things that you can talk about, you know, no more flowery stuff. You need rational judgment, you need data, you need statistics to support the claims that you're trying to make through public relations. So 
So this is another thing which is very, very important and related to public relations. We all as audiences want the companies to give us action rather than words. And that happens in everything that comes across. Uh, when we talk about persuasive communication, there is also one more thing that you must be able to relate with. How many of you remember the field of experience that Wilbur Schramm referred to in his model? How many of you remember that field of experience? No? Okay. Uh, you can go ahead and study that today by Google search that ma'am has just explained in the previous lecture. So do study that. But what I'm trying to tell you is that in his model, he tried to suggest that when two people communicate, they need to have some common platform of communication. You must have found this when you talk to, uh, you know, new people. If you have a common interest, you have some common areas of expertise, you relate better with that person. So field of experience refers to this only and public relation has very well identified that and it likes to tell you and talk to you about things that you can relate with. I hope you know about the current, uh, you know, meme culture, the viral culture, things are getting viral very quickly and there are new trends, there are certain news on which you find memes very quickly. So public relation is not, you know, uh, getting behind. It is trying to catch up with all these informations, all these trending memes, all these viral videos, and it is trying to use it in public relations so that you can relate to the information and you can connect with the information. Coming to the tools of public relation. You all know that there are two types of publics, right? The internal public and the external public. I think this uh, student that I can see in the middle should be given a mask because I can see only him smiling and the others are hiding their smile behind their mask. So anyway, that makes the class interesting, doesn't it? I mean, if I keep on talking and you don't react, then there is no point of communicating at all. So that's, that's good. That's really something that I really like. Okay, so coming to the tools of public relation. Before we actually talk about the tools, we definitely know that there are two types of publics. I hope everybody knows internal public and external public. How many of you know about that? Yes, you do? No, you don't. Okay. So every organization or every brand or any, any office that you're working in, for example, let's take this um, college that you are, you are in, you know, Every organization has internal publics as well as external publics. Internal publics are the people who are directly engaged with the organization, like, for example, you, the students, then the teachers, the staff, everybody who's working within the organization forms a part of the internal publics. Now, when we come to external publics, there are definitely certain people we want to impress with the communication that we make. I don't know why, but uh, I'm, you know, full of... Uh, Tears of happiness, I guess, because of the heat that we have today here. So uh, don't think that I'm crying while talking to you. It's just because of the excessive heat we are having here. <laughs> Coming back, uh, when we talk about external publics, external publics are the people who are not directly working with the organization, but they are somehow related to it. Uh, they might also be your customers. They might be people that you would like to connect with. For example, if we take university example once again, it would be the distributors, it would be the suppliers, it would be the bankers who have their branches in your uh, college, or maybe who are handling the fee payment and everything for your university. It might be other bodies or investors who are, and even the government, you know, the government obviously wants to know how you are doing in your university, how you're doing in your colleges. So these are the internal and external publics of a PR segment. And to both this public group, we need to communicate differently. For example, you must have seen that whatever notices that you get, maybe because uh, for the examination or any important notice that, for example, even for this seminar, you must have got messages on your WhatsApp group of the college, of the class, or the notice board that you have, or maybe your email account. So all these are the internal tools. But apart from that, that something which is very, very important in case of tools of public relation is actually the, the culture that you have in that particular organization. That has a lot of bearing and impacts much more than any other communication that you try to make. If you have visited, you know, stores of different brands, maybe you must have visited Airtel sometime or maybe Domino's sometime or Pizza Hut sometimes or maybe any other brand. You must have noticed that there is a specific culture that they follow, the way they dress, the way they walk, the way they talk to you. Everything is very much defined and trained, you know, 
so that also becomes a very important part of an organization and this goes much beyond the words that you say if you have experienced a courteous environment at any place you would prefer to go to that place again even if you have to spend more money uh, after going there so that has a very very lasting impact apart from that there are newsletters there are annual reports there are journals in house journals that many organizations bring uh, then there is email there are trainings and seminars there are also some uh, you know financial communications which are circulated to the officials there are notices these are the common tools that are used for communicating with the internal publics now when we come to the external public you all wherever you know whenever you want to find something about an organization i'm sure you people go to the social media so nowadays this has become the most important domain for any organization to be present on so most of the organizations are spending a lot of time a lot of energy and a lot of budget to increase and enhance their social media presence because that's where everybody is searching them on apart from that the common tools that have been always uh, that have always been a part of it their own websites their facebook pages their instagram pages their newsletters uh, then uh, mass media messages advertorials blogs uh, media relations uh influencers also have become a new tool that public relation companies and organizations have been using to reach out to their customers community relations is another very important tool and csr activities how many of you have heard about csr activities corporate social responsibility heard about it very good i'm liking two two boys there and this girl also the one in black and pink most uh, most active people in the batch yes you i'm talking about you only yes yes exactly you and the person next to you yeah colors up for that so that's exactly you know how pr works see there is a there is a class of so many students and i could notice only these two right this is exactly how pr works this is how you stand out from the crowd everybody is there everybody is doing something giving their reactions they have this advantage of sitting on the second row that is also one advantage that they have and the people at the back don't have but definitely they have in cash that opportunity that's how pr works you have to in cash every opportunity that comes your way now let me talk about the new paradigms of public relations you know what is changing we all know that we are very aware consumers nowadays you know uh, it's not possible that we consume information uh, without analyzing without thinking about the pros and cons we take information very seriously nowadays so now we are not just the audience of whatever pr organizations are giving to us we are now users you know you always have the choice to click to some other website you always have the choice to switch over you always have the choice to move on to another page or another website so you are the selector so the power is in your hands and that has become the new challenge for pr because you have to create so much of engaging content that the people don't leave your site or leave your organization and go to somebody else second thing that has happened in public relations is demarcification now we are catering to niche markets i don't know whether how many of you have instagram accounts i'm sure all of you must have instagram accounts okay great uh, is any of you influencer as well creating videos or something like that okay but you must be following influencers i'm sure some of them for some of the products right so what the example i want to give here is that nowadays if you go to instagram you will get a lot of personalized products for you you know products with your name pro products with your alphabet and then if you see the packaging the kind of packaging that they do with the thank you note you know everything is very personalized so that is exactly how pr has become right now it has become a very personalized thing so it is very important you know now to understand that the market is no more a big universe that you send out messages to it is more niche it's more uh, selected and that's how communication works now there is another shift from media to content earlier the public relations used to fo focus upon which media to use now they are more focused upon how to deliver appropriate content to you and what would be the right content then everything is happening real time like you are in front of me real time 
everything you must have seen that you are going live you know you're doing facebook live you are doing instagram reels you're going live every time so that's the kind of expectation we have with brands also we don't want brands to send us certain information and forget about it we want them to show us what is happening in their organizations at the real time so they create events they create stories they create uh, different activities which they can use for real time communication with the people multiplicity of channels is another challenge as uh, we discussed in the previous uh, session also that there are so many channels that you can access information on it has become difficult for the public relation organizations to ag- actually understand what is the actual media consumption pattern of the buyer or the user so there are so many channels and it has become imperative to be omnipresent because you and me we also know that we don't stick to one channel sometimes we are using so much of instagram that is that we start find uh, start finding it boring and we switch to some other thing you know so our habits are constantly changing and the public relation person nowadays need to keep track of these changes and actually create content for the different channels now another thing which has changed is interactivity earlier it was me as a pr person creating content and sending it to you now you are the creator everybody is creating content you are making videos you are making posts you are entering a restaurant you are making a shoot you are posting it on your online platforms and you are actually creating content for me so if i give you a bad service you will be quick enough to make a video you must have done that if you get a bad product from amazon you quickly make a video or any other place you make a video and you upload it you know i don't like this product and you give bad reviews to the product because you have experienced it so you are the creator so it has become all the more difficult for the pr organizations or pr persons to keep a track on what you are posting i only have control over what i say i don't have control over what you say so that has become a new challenge of pr and every pr firm or pr person today needs to be prepared about be prepared for crisis communication you must be able to relate with so many so many incidents that happened recently you know when overnight uh, zomato was in trouble because of some you know the delivery person eating the food uh, you know how it became and then there was a muslim delivery person that somebody refused to take order from so that also became another issue and zomato handled it by coming out and saying uh, food has no religion so every time because there is so much it is so much easier nowadays to make the content viral so the pr person has to be you know always alert that was not the case earlier because one viral tweet can be, you know reach billions of people before you actually start your crisis management practice so that has changed and now we don't only need the knowledge uh, data but now we need knowledge so this has changed drastically and 2022 after the covid impact public relation has changed even more because now there is more focus on content since everybody is out there telling you about something we need to deliver the content or maybe i should say storytelling has become the new way of communicating if you don't have powerful stories which relate with your uh, listeners or audience then you cannot be successful in public relations another thing which has become very important is analytics you all know that everybody is capturing your data the moment you go to google and search for something you have that information in your mail you have that information on your facebook you have that information on your instagram so because google is tracking your activities it is important for the pr persons to track the activities of the audience as well because they need to use this analytics to actually design the messages for their audiences and to be present when you need them the most so that is why analytics has become very very important nowadays influencer marketing i already told you has become the new jargon uh, that has been a cheaper method of promoting your ideas and services than uh, any other celebrity endorsement because you trust influencers more you always connect with them more because you think they are among them so that has become a new trend that public relation needs to catch up on uh, customer satisfaction is the key during the covid times many people have actually left their most trusted and you know usable brands just because they th- they thought or they found that during covid time these brands didn't behave the way they should have or they didn't give you the kind of services you required they were not available for you at the time when you needed them the most so due to that thing people have actually questioned several brands 
that has become a new trend. Uh, lastly, innovation is the key. Public relation, in public relation, it is very important to constantly understand the market and change. So I think uh, I should wind up here because we already also have one more speaker to listen to. I hope I have been able to add some knowledge and information to you. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a pleasure interacting with you all. Thank you, ma'am. So Dr. Pavrala is, is not over the phone. Over the phone. So we will now continue with the final conclusive ideas and recommendations, suggestions from each and every panel member. I would also request all the panel members to switch on their cameras so that from our side we can click a picture and uh, make this event a memorable one. So over to you, uh, Dr. Uma, sir. You, you may please start. I have a session immediately after that, so I, I don't think that I should be taking any more time here. Just to say that it's very important always to think of fresh, always to think uh, beyond the box. And we will talk about uh, some of these things in, 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 in my uh, you know, lecture in, in a few minutes. So, so uh, I keep it on till then. Any concluding ideas from you, ma'am, Shakila, ma'am? Yeah, I think it was firstly a very enriching uh, discussion for someone who is not so familiar with media studies, but I would only really urge uh, all of you who are here today, including my fellow panelists, to think of how the NEP could be a game changer in terms of transforming the way we look at not only the, the discipline per se, but also the pedagogy that needs to go into making that discipline more enriched. From the student's perspective, I would feel that being open-minded to accepting new things that come into the way a discipline broadens its scope is equally important. So I would say keeping an open mind in terms of not just the assimilation of new things that come about, but also being open to competition and a competitive spirit. I think, I don't know, we all think of competition as being a very uh, negative term. I would feel that we are living in an age where competition is the key to success and competitive spirit where we are challenged beyond our boundaries becomes very significant for survival. So the future of the 21st century learning and you as youth who are the ambassadors to carry this forward need to nurture a competitive spirit by keeping a very open-minded approach and challenging yourself to newer frontiers where you tend to excel because excellence is the way of success in today's world. So all the very best and thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you, you ma'am. Final recommendations from Dr. Anubhuti Yadav, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so like my final recommendation is, ma'am said competition is like the key. Uh, I would uh, say something which she has said before, uh, which is collaboration. So you need to collaborate with the students who are actually studying in other institutes. Uh, you need to collaborate with other organizations who are working in the area you are interested in. For example, like I, I spoke on media and information literacy. UNESCO is doing, you know, fabulous work in that. You know, our students nowadays, they are participating in youth debate series. So you should be aware on, you know, what different organizations are doing, what different people are doing, and you should be collaborate with, uh, with them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And Dr. Tanu, ma'am, final suggestions, any suggestions from you? I think all, I have already spoken a lot. So my final uh, suggestion would just be that like now you have listened to so many topics and everybody has talked about uh, collaboration and multidisciplinary learning. So I would just suggest that if, when you are doing that, keep your creativity intact, no matter what area that you select to work in. You always have to come up with creative and innovative ideas because that is something that the entire society needs. So that is my final closing point that whatever area that you work on in MassCom, make sure that you bring creative and innovative changes in the existing piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I thank all the respected panel members for sharing a very informative and a very effective session with all of us. 
on behalf of amrita school of arts and science kochi i once again thank the panel